Howdy, welcome to my new video series where I'm just going to basically pick a subject given to me at random by the community and I'm going to do it. I've been looking for a way to do longer videos. My other videos are smaller, more technically oriented. They're meant to kind of be a video supplement to API documentation. And I wanted to do some longer things. I had a request, for example, to do source control. While source control is not something inherent in the Unreal Engine 4, I mean, yes, there is a source control button and you can directly connect it, but source control itself is something outside the scope of Unreal and is a separate thing entirely. So it wouldn't really fit my normal video topics. However, I'm going to go ahead and start a new series to give me a break and to do fun stuff. It's going to be called Don't Give a Wank Wednesdays. It's kind of like Freebie Fridays, but on Wednesday, my kids have short days at school, so I have less time to actually do real work, so I'm going to screw around. So, our first topic is going to be creating health bars in UMG and giving them a little bit of style. So, what I did yesterday, even though it wasn't Wednesday, we'll pretend it was Wednesday, and we'll pretend this is Wednesday too, is I went ahead and created some health bars, and I slapped them in this template and you can see them right here. I wanted to give something a little bit more class. We have, for example, our health bar here, and let me go into it and uncheck something, and we'll run it. What I wanted to do was, this is our typical, like a fighter health bar, where every time you deal damage to it, it, it decrements and then it reduces itself, and mission accomplished, so I was happy with that. Uh, one of the nice things is I made that completely inside the blueprint itself, this widget itself right here, which is this, and everything's inside of it, which allows me to spawn my health bar, which itself does nothing but control it directly through the widget, and I can actually use timelines, so I can use curves, and I can use animations a lot easier, so that was nice. But I got to thinking maybe give it a little bit of extra pizzazz, so I made another version of it, and... When you use it, you'll notice the little bit of health bar just drops off. So I thought it was something nice and fun. In the process of me trying to figure this out, because originally I tried to start with a grid, and I found that on a grid uh, UMG object, you have access on the grid itself. Let's find it. Here's the grid. Let's say I put, okay, actually can't do that. Let's Let's start over then. Let's just make a new one. As you can see, my organization on my playground is, is awesome. Let's, okay, so let's say we're in here. Let's say we drag a grid in here. One of the things I thought would make a really nice way of doing this in a really cheeky fashion was your grids have nudges. So I could, for example, nudge this down 50, and you'll notice once I compile it, it's offset by 50. Well, I thought animating this would be a nice way to make it look like it was falling off, but the nudge git is accessible by blueprints, but the nudge set is not accessible by blueprints. It's probably due to the way it needs to create the layout at design time rather than run time, so that was a small issue. Well, in the process of figuring that out, I made another health bar just for fun, and this is the result of that. Every time you shoot, it gives a little jingle, fades to a white clear transparent, I color it red, and then it drops down and fades out. I just thought it was nice and something for fun. So we'll go over these in basic form. The actual files themselves will be available later and I will link them in the video and I will link them below. They are not 100% complete. They are coded and commented and as cleaned up as possible, but there are some bugs. For example, you can continue shooting and it will try to decrement your hearts or it will try to decrement the health if you shoot too many times. And well, that's up to someone else to fix. This is just an example for fun. So if we start with, let's say our, let's go with the heart one first. So with the heart one, I went ahead and I put all of the code inside of the widget itself and the widget itself has a event called remove heart and that is called when we sh fire at it and it triggers the take damage on the blueprint itself because if you go into the blueprint for this item 
you'll notice it has a take damage from a blueprint interface and then it calls the health bar and it removes the heart. I also, one of the things I thought was fun is if you notice this health bar, it's always facing one direction, but I made just a nice little event tick so that way that health bar would follow you around. I also found out for fun, if you go into here and we go into our cube and we turn back on physics and we lock a few rotations, when you fire the cube, it goes off spinning like a hockey puck. And if you notice, that user interface stays at the top at all times, and it also faces you. So I thought that was a pretty cool effect. It's also fun as hell to just shoot this thing around. So that might make a fun little game. Let's see? Well, okay, let's go back to this. Anyways, everything's inside of the health bar itself. So what I've done is basically when it constructs itself, it finds out how many hearts you have by going through and manually setting it manually setting it up and I just left the extra code originally with 10 hearts in there. It's This is a very silly way of doing it but this is quick, simple, and dirty just to get an effect. Now the tick itself. The tick I run in a sequence and it just sees if it is supposed to move. If it does, it runs the move image function. It checks to see if it should change color. If so, it runs that function and it checks to see if it should shake it and it runs that function. And all I do is I take the current item one at a time whenever we need to remove the heart by firing the event. I set the current location of that heart and store it for later. I tell it it should shake. Now here's where the biggest difference between doing inside the widget and outside the widget was. You cannot use timelines inside of user interface widgets. You can use delays, but you cannot use timelines. So things have to get tricky. So I basically cue the shaking, delay for three sec point three seconds, change my heart texture to empty and color it red because by default it's white, wait 0.4 seconds, cue up the color change which is where it fades, I go ahead and delay 0.4 seconds and then I go ahead and move it down on our Y axis and set it to go. And you'll notice on the tick, like I said, it basically checks each of these. It's a really silly way of doing it, but since I have to do it inside, I kind of have to queue up everything. And then all this does is if it's supposed to do it, it'll run that event. And then these are really simple. If it needs to move it, it goes based on the timeline I tell it to do it, which is our alert time, which we have set in each side, just manually set for how long it should be doing everything. Based on the speed, I go ahead and multiply it a little bit here and create our new lerp time. I cap it at one just so that way we're not going over because I can't use a timeline so this is like a manual timeline. And this goes ahead, for example, this is the move image. This one goes ahead and moves it down and changes the opacity from full to completely transparent. And once we're done doing all of that, it goes ahead and checks to make to see if we've done it for long enough. And if we've done it for long enough, we go ahead and we reset everything back and we say we're done moving. And all the other functions are basically the same. Change color. It's the same basic thing. Cache or delta. Modify our delta to make it run faster or slower as we want. Set our color and opacity. And then once that's done, we go ahead and reset it until it, the color change is done. And shake image. That is an annoying bug. Shake image is basically the exact same thing. The only thing we do with shake image is basically we set a random position between minus 10 plus 10 on the X and minus 10 plus 10 on the Y. And then we go ahead and just randomly do that a few times for our 0.3 duration. So that's it. That's how our little heart one works. And to play it again, when you shoot it, we'll see it. Well, let's go ahead and fix the little bit of gravity there, shall we? And we'll go ahead and get our cube and shut physics back off and run that again. Okay, and you'll notice it goes through each of the steps. It shakes, it fades, it drops. Shakes, changes color, and drops. So pretty simple. Now, one of the only issues with that, again, you can't use timelines. But I made another item when I made this other bar. You can use timelines with this one. So let's go ahead and open this one up. This one itself is actually completely inside the blueprint itself and the blueprint 
creates the widget inside of it. So in our begin play, we go ahead and we have our user widget, which is our double progress bar. Our double progress bar is really simple. It's just simply an overlay with a couple images and then a progress bar using the background, which is yellow, progress bar using the foreground, which is green, and then the drop bar, which is just a image that I use to fake this area right here that we will use to drop off. So it's, there's no code at all. This is just a user interface with some exposed variables. So we go ahead and we cast and set a referent, reference to our progress bar. That way we don't have to go ahead and do the widget, get user widget cast every time we need it. We go ahead and cache our front bar, our back bar, and our drop bar. That way we have those for use later. I have a cheap little function here that simply sets the progress bar to whatever our current value is. And by default, I have our current value set to 100. So basically, as you notice in here, for demonstration purposes, it's not full. But when we run it, it goes to full. It's just a nice way of making it look good. And then I go ahead and cache the start and end values for the current health. Now, all the magic takes place, again, in a blueprint interface. Anytime this thing takes damage, which every time we fire the gun, if we find our blueprint for our first person character, I just modified it slightly. And all I did was, in addition to the impulse on your standard third person blueprint, I take the actor that's hit, I check and see if it implements the interface, BPI damageable. And if it does, I simply call take damage, which is the only function inside my BPI damageable. So really simple and nice. So if you notice, for example, it won't call it when I shoot anything else, just this item. So here we go, we take damage. So determine how much damage we take. I have it set to 10 just to make it nice and simple. And then we check and see if we're already taking damage. You'll notice when we run, when you shoot, the green bar will go down and the yellow bar will be behind it and then the yellow bar will slowly decrement. So if we shoot once, it goes off. But if we shoot more than once, we need to make sure that the yellow bar knows where it starts and ends at. That's a small bug because I didn't shoot fast enough. So if we run it again, for example, you'll notice it needs to know where it starts and falls off to end. But if we don't reset our starting and ending positions to the correct spot, when we're already firing and already on what I call a cooldown, then it's going to have an issue. So basically it checks to see if we're taking damage. If we are, we adjust our start percentage to what the current start percentage is in terms of our uh, 0 to 1 on the lerp for the value between 0% and 100%. So we just need to adjust as needed. Then we set our cooldown timer back to 1. Basically I give 1 second of not taking damage before the bar falls off. And then we start our timeline, which basically we lerp the front bar over 0.4 seconds to, that's our initial green bar. Once we shoot, it drops down really quickly. That is what this is right here. We go ahead and we set our percentages once it's done. And then we go ahead and set our values to what our back bar, where our back bar should start and our back bar for, should end. And this is only set to fire once we've actually finished this lerp. And you'll notice this lerp is set to reset every time it takes damage. That way we can keep track of where that back yellow bar is supposed to be. So once that's done, we have our event tick. So our event tick here stores our delta. And only if we are in a cooldown period. For example, we've gone ahead and set that we should which is right here, we've taken damage and we're going to have to do something. Should we go on? If not, it's just going to stop right there. Then we check and see if our cooldown time is less than or equal to zero because over here we're going to be decrementing it later on. And if it is right here, we take the cooldown time, we subtract the delta, and it's now our new cooldown time. If that cooldown time is less than or equal to zero, for example, we're done, there's no more cooldown period, then we're going to go ahead and move on and this is just my little example branch to see which drop bar you're going to see. Right now it'll go to the drop back bar. We go in here. We have our cooldown time set to negative one. Negative one indicates we are done with our cooldown. We should not try to continue decrementing. We are going to modify our yellow bar and do something with it. And then we go ahead and we set our current health value to the, where the bar ended. So that way we now have our new value for our current health. So... 
drop back bar. Well, actually, let's start with the update back bar. This is that really simple version where if I go ahead and update this and hit play, you'll notice it simply goes down. You also notice there's a little bit of a stop and pop at the end, which was nice because I could accomplish that in timelines by simply setting a nonlinear curve with a nice little pop at the end. So that's one advantage of doing it in here. So we just simply start our timeline. We alert from the start to the end for our back bar. And then once we're done, that's it. That's all we do. That's just as simple as that. It's a nice little bar that progresses down. Now if we go ahead and turn this back on and we fire it off, you'll notice it looks like it's dropping off and fading into the distance. Well, for that, we have our drop back bar. This one's a lot more complicated, so we'll go through it as best as possible. And keep in mind, you'll have access to all the code, so it's nice and simple. So we take our drop back bar event. We set the percentage of our back progress bar. Remember, that's our yellow bar. We set it to the endpoint and modulated from 0 to 100% to point from 0 to 100% to 0 to 1 because that is the way the percentage on the progress bar works. That way our yellow bar itself just instantly disappears and what we're going to do in the next steps is we're going to replace it with an image that looks just like it. So right here, how much damage did we take and considering our bar is 350 and it's 100 units in length, that's 3.5 units per percentage. So doing this, we figure out how long it is, and then I subtract 5 because I want the thing to not... I want it to be offset a little bit on the right-hand side uh, based on the little black border that you can see when we run it. You notice there's a little black border around it, and I just want it offset a little bit. So that'll give us how big our bar should be in relation to how much damage we took. It should basically match how much damage we took, which was that yellow section. And then we set the Y to 45 again to offset. It's 50 normally, we set to 45 to offset for the black. Then we go ahead and we set the size of our image. So now we actually have a yellow bar that will be the exact same time size as the yellow section that we have removed. So we'll go to the next one. Well, now we need to set where this is going to be. Well, we do a little bit of math here. We basically figure out where the bar currently is. Then we figure out how much health we've lost and multiply it by 3.5. So if we lost 10 units, we have a 35 unit width in terms of how much damage we lost. And that's how much that yellow bar should look. It should look 35 units wide. And we go ahead and we add that to our starting X and our ending X. And then we go and add 45 to our ending Y because we want to move down 45 units. The start X, uh, start position, and end position are going to be on the animation where it's starting. So basically the bar itself, as you can see, is here. And this will be our starting X. And it's going to go down to here to indicate that it's falling. So if you notice, it falls. And there we go. Actually, a good way of showing this in, as an example is we have this other section here. Let's go ahead and simply, let's go ahead and, well, actually, we'll just go ahead and stop it right here. We will not play the rendering or the, the render angle or the opacity. We'll run it just setting position. So now you'll notice it'll just drop straight down. Now the opacity, because we're not setting it, it looks a little messed up. But this is, again, this is just so you get the effect that we want. So, after we've determined the size of the bar, as you saw, and what should happen to it, we go ahead and set the position to where it's supposed to be. So now, we originally started with a back progress bar that was yellow in color that showed how much damage we lost. We immediately made that section of damage disappear and immediately replaced it with an image that looked identical to it. So, it's a little bit of magic. Well, you know, video game magic. That's how things work. As long as it looks right, it's good. We go ahead and we set the opacity to 1 so that way we can actually see it because at the end over here we set the opacity to a different, um, to 0. I could always just set this down here back to 1 but it just makes it easier to make sure we, we can see it. So we will go ahead and we start our timeline. Our timeline is just a straight lerp from 0 to 1 and that's all we do. We take and we lerp over time which is set to half a second. 
we go from our starting position to our ending position. At the same time, we go ahead and we change a render angle from 0 to 45. I hooked it back up, we'll run it, and you'll notice this time it will angle down. Nice little effect. And then at the same time, we do a 0 to 1 on the opacity, and you'll notice it just nicely fades off. So it's just a nice little effect. One nice thing is because this is all built into, and then of course when we finish, I should cover that, we go ahead and reset our position back to the beginning and reset our render, render angle back to zero because if we don't, the next time it starts, it'll snap into position. Just, you know, fun stuff. And that's it. That is what is needed to do for the decreasing health bar. So advantages and disadvantages of the two of the things. you could I could have accomplished both using either way. But with this one, you are kind of segregating the widget itself from the blueprint it's attached to. Um, you're decoupling it, which means the widget itself, once it fires its event, takes care of itself. But it makes it a little more difficult to handle things because you're handling delays. In this one, everything is part of the blueprint itself, which means anything that has to be done, it can control how it looks. So I personally like this version, maybe make a generic blueprint called a, a, a damage manager or something, and it takes and manages damage on where it's supposed to go. Or, I mean, you can always, because it's part of the blueprint, if you wanted to, you could go into here and you could open up the blueprint. And if I was to take all of this stuff and basically move it into, for example, the event tick stuff, I could move into its own section called you know manage health bar and then you take all this and you move it into the players blueprint class down here for example now let's say i took the first person character duplicated it and i moved all of that into here then that health bar itself would show up on the player and it would react just like you saw every time if a projectile was fired at it and that projectile checked if it was a bpi you know if our first person character for example under class settings implemented damageable and we had the take damage from the bpi interface then it would react just the same so it's a nice way of using this reusable code you could basically just copy paste this there's no right way there's no wrong way i just my goal was someone showed tom lumen doing his little health bar widget for a fighting game and i thought oh that's pretty cool i want to duplicate it I failed and ended up with the hearts in a really cool hockey puck effect. And then I decided to try harder and I made this one and I decided, well, I want it to look even cooler and I made the little drop off effect. I think it's pretty nifty. Everything's of course changeable. Um, you custom tailor to whatever you want. You know, it's just for fun. That's the entire point of this. Uh, the, the, the point of the don't give a wink Wednesdays is I'm going to just play around with something. I was thinking maybe if I can figure out a good topic for example i because i spent a good three four hours doing this i unfortunately have to say that a lot of that time was spent on math in this section down here trying to get positioning and trying to take care of things like this right here for starting and ending i will recommend if anyone is listening to this do as much math as you can in school go to as many websites as you can like coding math websites on youtube and learn as much as you can about math because once you get past simple stuff you need math there was one of those nice little boards hanging up on the wall when i was in school and it was how much math do you need to know in your future workplace this was 25 years ago or so i want to say 20, 20, yeah, 25 years or so ago, and programming was one of those smaller things. We, we used old, I want to say 386s at the time, maybe 386s, and we had giant tape backups that would hold megabytes worth of storage, and we programmed in QBasic. So nobody thought about what was needed for programming in the future. So I never really thought I needed math and I basically stopped at Algebra 2. I took Algebra 2 for four years, purposely failed it because I didn't really see the need to go on to anything harder like trigonometry, and it was stupid. Don't do it. Take as much math as you can if you're still in school. You're going to need math if you want to be a programmer. Just as simple as that. I think I got off topic, but what I was 
going to try to get at was maybe I can go ahead if I find a good topic like this where it'll take a little bit of time and it might be enjoyable to learn. I think I might stream it on YouTube and then I might get two people who can watch me and make fun of me and tell me how silly it is for me using a LERP instead of a V interp node, for example, or something stupid like that. So I'm going to go ahead and end this here. I'm going to go ahead and try to get my new outro video working that I spent a whopping five minutes on last night, just so that way you know when the videos end. So have a good day and I will see you guys next week.